We know that when people have to endure a horrible storm or a fire or a drought, they come to understand more about the climate crisis that we face. Uh, you know, when people see, as they have in many countries around the world, clean air all of a sudden, then they realize some of what they're missing. I mean, there are plenty of people on this planet um, in cities like, say, Delhi, who literally had never had a lung full of clean air in their lives before. Now, that doesn't make the pandemic a good thing, and it's not even a silver lining to the pandemic. But if we're going to go through this much pain and agony and this many people dying and suffering and things, then we might as well take a lesson or two from it. And and one of them is there are different ways of arranging things on our earth. You wrote your first book, uh, The End of Nature, in uh, 1989. So in your opinion, what has changed since then in, in terms of people awareness uh, to the problem of climate change and global warming? Truthfully, uh, I think that people's awareness in many ways got worse, at least for much of that 30 years. And that's because when I first wrote about it, it, it was the first book about climate change. And so people didn't yet have, uh, people were, people understood that it's like, okay, this is a bad problem that scientists are worried about. We should do something. Then the fossil fuel industry went to work and they ran this 30 year, incredibly expensive, incredibly sophisticated disinformation campaign to make people doubt whether scientists knew what they were talking about, to make people doubt whether climate change was real on and on and on. And unfortunately, that kind of stuff works. If you spend enough money telling people lies, then some people are going to believe them. And, you know, the fossil fuel industry in my country purchased one of our political parties, the Republican Party, and it terrified the other party. Uh, and it made lots of ordinary people very confused. That's finally starting to break now because a we've built a big movement to try and counter the fossil fuel industry and b as i said before mother nature is a good teacher you know at a certain point if the hillside outside your house is suddenly on fire you're likely to think huh maybe there is something to that after all you know um so the polling now shows most americans And most are like most people around the world, very worried about climate change. But there was a deadly 30 year hiatus there uh, where the fossil fuel industry was able to spread their lies with great effect. In terms of um, leading the way or showing the example, ideally, you'll get someone at the top level, someone in power to show the way forward. Um, I know you are a supporter of Bernie Sanders. Do you believe the U.S. could see a progressive like him uh, as president in the short-term future? And then could this person, as, as progressive as it, or he or she might be, truly change things while under a, a capitalist model? So political change um, comes more slowly often than we want it to. And it doesn't look like Bernie's going to be president this time around. And given his age, he probably won't be president ever, you know. Um, and I doubt that we'll get, I mean, it doesn't look like Joe Biden is a huge progressive. Which means that it would be a good idea to elect him and then a good idea to push really hard to get him to do what he can and will do. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think it makes sense to wait until you've got the absolute perfect person in charge before you try to do anything. Uh, I think human beings generally end up working with where they are and what they have, you know? Um, um, and I also don't think that we should rest all of our hopes in the political system either. Um, politics, even at the best of times, moves slowly. And as we've discussed, we need to move quickly. 
So I think we also should put huge pressure on the world's financial systems, not just on Washington, but on Wall Street. And that's what we've been doing hard. You know, I was arrested in the lobby of the Chase Bank nearest the Capitol uh, in January. I wasn't trying to rob the bank. I was uh, trying to change them, trying to keep, trying to uh, keep them from becoming or being the world's largest funder of the fossil fuel industry. So we've been putting immense pressure on the kind of pillars of global capital, and that seems to me that that's a smart thing to do too, um, because they're global and because they move quickly sometimes. I want you to go back. Um about the question about education, because I think it's key for every topic. Um, but how important a role, in your opinion, the media plays in the question of education or de-education in, in the matter of, of our role on planet Earth? So the media did a very poor job around climate change for a long time. It treated it as a kind of uh, both sides story and you know, so on and so forth, really failed, I think. And I'm a journalist, so, you know, it was a shame to watch it fail in those ways. I think in the last four or five years, an awful lot of journalism has done a great job around these issues. I think if you open the New York Times or the Washington Post now, or if you, you know, read The Guardian or the, you know, Le Monde or, you know, any of the great newspapers in the world, they're uh, providing a steady stream of powerful information. But who knows how much of that, who knows really what constitutes journalism at this point anyway? Who knows how that stacks up against some piece of nonsense that someone forwards you on Facebook or you know, the latest tweet from someone or you know whatever? I, I don't really pretend to quite understand how the how media, <laughs> journalism, and information flow around the world at the moment. But I think that those people who are professional journalists in many cases are, are now doing the best they can around this. So my final question is about, in a way, how do we do it as, as you know, civil society activists? Um, so you, you were part of a, a collective, a book um, called Fight Global Warming Now, published in 2007, and actually you gave activists means to organize their local communities. So yes. do, you, do you still think that this is the way to go, right? To educate and start local and then move slowly to well, something? Yeah. My vision of a movement always is you need to have a lot of people working at every local level because so much of this gets done locally. You know, what does your city council do about this, that, or the other thing? But you need to have that movement network together, too, so that a couple of times a year it can come together to make a big noise nationally and globally uh, and exert some real influence on larger systems, too. So that's what we've always tried to do at 350 is be both local and very networked. And I think that you see other people doing the same thing now, too. And it's, I, think it's, I think it's the only uh, way to do this. Thanks, Bill. Frank, thank you. Thanks a bunch much. for your time. It's fun to talk. You stay safe and healthy, okay? You too. Cheers. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.